Welcome to A Moment of Bach, where we take our favorite moments from the composer's vast musical output, just a minute's worth or even a few seconds, and show you why we think they are remarkable. We are your hosts, Alex and Christian Giebert. Today we're looking at the Magnificat, specifically the Esurientes movement of Bach's Magnificat. In the book of Luke, an angel comes to Mary and says, Greetings to you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Don't be afraid. You found favor with God. You will give birth to a son. You were to call him Jesus, and so on. And then in that part of the story, uh, the angel also tells her that even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age. So then Mary goes and visits her cousin Elizabeth. The baby in Elizabeth's womb leaps for joy. And then this next part of of this chapter often has a header that says Mary's song, although it doesn't say she sings, it says Mary said. And then it's the Magnificat. Those words that we now call the Magnificat, which is the Latin version of, of what we see here, which is, my soul glorifies the Lord. Sometimes we know this as, my soul doth magnify the Lord, in older English versions. So the running theme of this large work that Bach set across many movements is that of rejoicing in the good things and the good fortune and favor that has been given to her by God. And so one of the parts says, his mercy extends to those who fear him from generation to generation. He has performed mighty deeds with his arm. And it also has parts that say that God is fair, and so he helps the people who need it, and he takes away from those who don't need it. He has scattered those who are proud. We talked about this last week. A few years ago, something was uh, popularly shared around the internet by Matt Korostov, and it is a scrolling website, web page, where you can use space on your screen to show wealth in scale between the average person uh, in the United States and billionaires. When you go to this web page, which is called Wealth Shown to Scale, you scroll and one pixel is a thousand dollars, a thousand US dollars. And then it shows a little square that's a million. And then it shows Uh, visually how big a billion looks in comparison to a million because it's vastly bigger. And then it shows the wealth of Jeff Bezos, the billionaire, at least as this was last year in 2021 when this was last updated, which was 185 billion US dollars. And you have to scroll and scroll and scroll. It's really an amazing visualization of how much ridiculously larger his wealth is than, than others. After you make it all the way to his 185 billion, then the website shows you that the 400 richest United States citizens possess 3.2 trillion US dollars. And I'll quote him here. Jeff Bezos may be insanely rich, but it is a drop in the ocean compared to the combined wealth of his peers. The 400 richest Americans own about 3.2 trillion, which is more than the bottom 60% of Americans. That brings us to the Esurientes alto aria, which is one of the loveliest couple of minutes of music that there maybe there is. <laughs> the Latin text, which we have translated here into English for the Esurientes aria is, He, that is God, has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty. So most parts of the Magnificat are like this. They have a dichotomy to them. The first part is praising the blessings, sometimes the material blessings that God has given you, like Mary being thankful that she was chosen to bear Jesus, almost thinking, why was it me? Why did you choose me? I'm just a regular Jewish person. But she was happy to be chosen and ready to bear that burden. And then the other half is usually like, he has scattered the proud. He has brought down the powerful from their thrones. He has sent the rich away empty. So 
So there's a there's this concept of justice in the Magnificat, and this is how these ancient people dealt with their wealth inequality. So this wealth inequality issue, it's so common throughout human history. It manifests in so many different ways. What we just read from this from this website illustrates the particular issue that it is today. But in biblical times, it was also there was also wealth inequality. But the way people dealt with it was things like the Magnificat. Scripture helped them frame the situation to count their blessings. Which is a way to say it's a way to say that, I guess. And Bach knew this as he sets this text, he gets to uh, he gets to cram two distinctly different or opposite thoughts into one aria. And that's an interesting challenge for him. And you can tell that he enjoyed it. And that's why we have such a delightful flute duet beginning this aria. And I'm going to say, Alex, that I think I think this is a pretty fair assumption that that is also why the first line, Esurientes implevit bonis, he has filled the hungry with good things, often ascends. It's often going up. Hmm. The second line, et divites dimisit inanes, and sent the rich away empty, is usually going down. So there is a contour musically related. Whenever these flutes pass off these wonderful lines to each other, it's so lovely and I think this is the expression of bounty for the poor. There's a, there's a big theme in, in the New Testament about that very thing, in actually the Bible as a whole, of justice for the poor, especially with regards to Jesus, actual stories, like Jesus feeding the 5,000, that kind of thing. The two most remarkable things about the Asuriantes Aria, I think, one of them is near the end and the other one is the end. The first time comes near the end of where the singer is almost done. We pause on dimisit, and then finally inanes, dimisit inanes. And I think what's happening there is that we're leaving them hanging. We're leaving the rich empty-handed. So then it brings us to the most striking part of the aria, which is the last note. There's something conspicuously absent from the end, wouldn't you say, Alex? Yeah, there is. There is just no, there's just no terminal note. There's no final r resolving note on the downbeat of the last note. The last note, there should be flute, there should be a flute note there. But there isn't because we leave them empty-handed. That is probably why he did that. It's a great point, Christian. I I didn't think about that connection. It's a pretty good guess though. We looked at we both looked at this score and sure enough it does have a, just a rest there for the flutes on the last measure. It's got to be on purpose. We know that Bach didn't do anything. Like, that's the kind of thing that Bach would not have let let go and just made a mistake on. You know, it bears saying, I guess, you can't, it's like kind of an elephant in the room, I guess, that I'm calling out here. That Bach himself was a member of the, like, higher class, basically, you know, not, not super high class, but certainly, like, enjoyed a life of more luxury than, like, peasants of the day, you know. He still had to work a lot for his, for his salary and and stuff like that. It wasn't like he had everything handed to him. But I'm sure that from everything we know that he did believe in this, in the message of all the scripture that he was setting to music. And this would have been no exception. (laughs) 
Yeah, there was certainly a wealth divide between his class and the more aristocratic above him and royal above him, I'm sure. But that actually is kind of like that divide in a way is like our divide now between our American middle and lower middle class along with an upper middle class against the ultra wealthy because now it's it's still it, there's still a huge divide i guess number wise the divide is probably bigger now because the billionaires have so much and there's so few of them but it's it's really interesting nowadays because people who you who appear wealthy they have giant homes and everything and maybe multiple houses and, and all kinds of all kinds of material wealth those people are still nothing compared to the top 0.0001% of United States citizens who are those billionaires. And so the this disparity is something that everyone has always had to deal with. Bach would have been very aware of that in his time. And it's better it's better to be idealistic, I think, about it in this way than, than not to. I don't think, in other words, I don't think it slows down progress. To be idealistic in saying what uh, Bach is using biblically is what it should be, is that God or some power of justice should level everything out. And thinking that way is good uh, for him because it keeps it public. You know, to write music about, about this, to have it, to have the Magnificat set to text over and over again throughout human history, we, we can't ignore what it says. It says, God wants the poor to be blessed with abundant riches and to basically to have what they need. And if they're rich, they, they're sent away empty-handed. And then there's there's even that, that line that, that the rich man, it's harder for the rich man to enter heaven than it is for, the, for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle. Hmm. It's a very vivid imagery there. Right, and this Magnificat is about the coming of Christ, right? Being the gift that for the entire world, but also a gift, but also a child that was born under like some of the poorest circumstances in, in, in a very non-flashy place, you know? Just along with the animals, right? Had to sleep in a manger. Like this is, this is not the, you know, this is not the upper class we're talking about here. Right, in other words, the, the ultra-wealthy, they are not the people in history that will go down as as the most important the most important people in history might be born in filth you know and also we might expect those people to be more royally important or maybe like military leaders or some glorious general or something like jesus you know a lot of jewish people were expecting at that time that he was going to be a king like he's going to throw out the Romans, basically, or maybe lead some sort of military rebellion and get the Roman occupation out of the Middle East. But that's not what it was. It was humble. He was a member of the lower class, relatively, and he fed the poor, and he ostracized the rich, and he put the rich in their place. He told them they could not enter heaven with this kind of extreme illustration. He was, uh, he was trying to level the playing field a bit. Right, and the gift, the gift is the same, the, the gift of eternal life, I should say. The gift is the same for each person. It doesn't matter, right? If you're rich or poor, Jesus still died for you, right? Universal justification is what most Christians believe in. They don't believe that everybody's going to heaven, but they believe that Jesus died for everybody. And... The point there that is made in the scripture about it being way harder for someone who is rich to make it to heaven than someone who is poor is simply because of the love of money, right? The reliance on money, the obsession with money, and the unwillingness to give money toward causes that really need it. On the website that you that you showed, Christian, there are lots of sobering statistics, but one that really struck me was the amount of money which is a lot to us, the amount of money that would cost to effectively eradicate malaria and save millions of children from dying of malaria, especially in poorer countries, that amount of money would feel like nothing to, to the several hundred of the world's richest people. Then it just comes down to 
why aren't they giving that money to that cause? Like, what could be more noble than saving children from dying from malaria? There's something, there's something like genetic about, about humans that when we receive excess wealth, it becomes an, a, a hoarding obsession, no longer about the actual stuff, but about the wealth itself and the, the uncontrollable urge to grow that wealth and to just hoard it, you know, just to hang on to it. And so the Magnificat text is in fierce opposition to that human urge. And that's why it speaks to us today, even though it's thousands of years old. And now, here is that moment from the end of the Esurientes aria of the Magnificat. If this introduction to a musical moment has inspired you to listen to this entire aria or to the entire Bach Magnificat, follow the link in the description to see the full performance of that work. Do you want to hear our new episodes as we release them? Find us in your podcast app and hit subscribe. That way, they will download automatically to your device. Also, listeners, we want to give a big thank you to those of you who in recent months have written in and made suggestions about musical moments that you love, especially those of you who helped us out by picking ones that we already know have been recorded and released by the Netherlands Bach Society, which means that we can very easily make Moment of Bach episodes on those uh, those topics. And um, we haven't got back to all of you yet to confirm when your episode will be, but if you wrote in, you uh, your ideas will uh, be implemented, so don't worry. Which leads me to this question, Alex. What will we be looking at next week? Next week, we will take a listener request and look at what happens to be my favorite movement of the Mass in B minor, and that is the last movement of the Gloria section, the Cum Sancto Spiritu movement. Until next time, enjoy those moments. Mm-hmm.